All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Laura, and welcome everybody to our webcast here on cloud static analysis. Now, in addition to some tools, static analysis tools that we're going to talk about and show you during the session today, we're also going to talk about some other, well, static analysis and DevSecOps best practices. And along the way, we're going to have four different demos. Now, these are, I'll tell you up front, these are basic demos, foundational demos, just to get you familiar with kind of the workflow a little bit and with some of these static analysis tools. And so this material is actually based on um, what we see here on the slide, the SEC 540 Cloud Security and DevSecOps Automation class. Now, I'm a co-author of that class along with uh, ben, uh, ben Allen and Eric Johnson. And uh, yeah, we just want to share with you today a little bit, well, some of these best practices in terms of what we think about when we think about integrating security into our overall DevOps and uh, CI CD pipelines. Now, quick logistical item here that I want to mention. We are presenting, we've been doing you know, these remote presentations for a long time now, but I have recently noticed that every once in a while, Zoom, which we're using today, for some reason, when I advance slides or when I switch between windows, um, it actually doesn't advance the slide. So at any point, right, I'll try to give you some verbal cues, but you see that the slide is not actually advancing. Feel free to go ahead and chime in here in chat and let me know if you see anything that seems to be awry. Also, feel free to go ahead and chime in with questions or comments anytime here in the chat window or the Q&A panel. Um, you know, I'll keep an eye on that and try to address those as we go along, but we'll also have some time for some questions at the very end as well. Now, with that being said, very quick introduction. I've been teaching writing classes for SANS for a long time, uh, formerly the CISO here, currently lead our cloud security and our cybersecurity leadership curriculum, and the author, co-author of a number of different classes that you see down here at the bottom. If you want to stay in touch afterwards, feel free to hit me up on email or LinkedIn or connect with me on Twitter and social media. Happy to stay in touch after this as well. So let's go ahead and dive in here. Now, related to the SEC 540 class that I had mentioned earlier, one of the things that we like to do is we like to have some well, vulnerable applications, some vulnerable systems that we improve the security on and we analyze as we go along. And the vulnerable system, the vulnerable application that we have here is the Dunder Mifflin application. Some of you might be fans of the well, popular TV show, The Office, where we've got the fictional company Dunder Mifflin. And you can see here that we've got a, yes, a, a beautiful homepage. It went through a recent redesign here that, uh, that people use to, that employees use to access different things that customers use to access different bits of functionality for this fictional organization. Now, if that's the app itself, well, where are we running this app? Of course, right here, we're talking about cloud, cloud static analysis. Well, we are gonna be deploying, we deploy this app up into the cloud. And we're gonna see some infrastructure code as we go along today that is both in AWS and running the app in Azure as well. Now, here's the high level architecture for what our Dunder Mifflin cloud infrastructure looks like. Specifically, we see what this looks like in AWS. We've got some AWS services and AWS icons, but at a high level, conceptually, the way that you deploy this to Azure is basically the same thing. We've got your traditional multi-tiered, three-tiered architecture here, where you've got users coming in on the left-hand side from the internet. We've got your ALB, your application load balancer. And you can see here in this next tier, we've got our publicly available web instances. Ah. But on the back end, we've got another ALB, another application load balancer, and some API instances over here on the right-hand side. Now, certainly API security is another extremely important topic. There's, we have other webcasts and sessions about that. I see that Alex asks, hey, are we going to be covering container and cloud mesh tools like Istio? We won't be talking about those here in this particular session. Yeah, but we've got some other sessions that are talking about containers and Kubernetes and service meshes, things like that. Certainly, yet a lot of that is to help enable these different bits of application functionality, different APIs and this microservices architecture that many of our organizations are utilizing in, uh, in today's world. So if that was the high level 
design, the logical architecture of what that actually looks like, well, how do we actually go about deploying, creating this infrastructure? And we do that by, of course, utilizing various different pieces of infrastructure as code. The different cloud providers, of course, all have their own infrastructure as code services available, AWS with CloudFormation, Azure with Resource Manager, Google GCP with Deployment Manager. And on the far right-hand side, we've got HashiCorp, probably the most well-known for their uh, vault tool. They've got a number of other great cloud-related tools, one of them being Terraform. Terraform is another infrastructure as code language that allows you to create infrastructure code well using one common set of uh, syntax for all of these other three, right, to deploy to these various clouds and more as well. Now, I mentioned with the Dunder Mifflin application, we've got this deployed to both AWS and to Azure. Now, it just so happens that, hey, when you're writing this infrastructure code, well, you've got to choose which language you're going to write it in. We happened to, at the time, some time ago, write our Dunder Mifflin infrastructure using CloudFormation. So all of the code that we're going to be utilizing, scanning with our tools here in this session is uh, for AWS is written in CloudFormation. And for Azure, well, since that was developed a little bit later, we decided to use Terraform. So all of that code for the Azure infrastructure for our Dunder Mifflin app is all in Terraform. So just a heads up, right? Those are the, the constraints that we have. Now, certainly, how do you figure this out? How do you know that the code is CloudFormation? How do you know it's Terraform? Yeah, certainly you could do a Git clone, download that code, and take a look at it. And it will quickly become evident what that code actually looks like. I've done many code reviews in my career over the years. And you know, sometimes you want to get a quicker view, take a little bit, get a high level view, a summary of what that code looks like that you are going to be reviewing. This is where this nice little tool, this little utility called SCC comes into play. Maybe some of you have used it. If not, highly recommend checking it out. It is uh, freely available at Ben Boiter's GitHub uh, repo that we see listed here. Right? It stands for SLOC, single uh, source lines of code, clock lines of code, and um, also known as succinct code counter. Very useful tool. What does it actually do? Here on the next slide, well, you can see that from a cloud formation perspective, when I run SCC against my cloud formation templates, my AWS infrastructure code, you can see that for the Dunder Mifflin application, for the Dunder Mifflin infrastructure, not the application code, but for the infrastructure code, this is what it looks like. We've got over 3,000 lines of YAML code that make up all of our infrastructure de uh, defined in cloud formation. Now, there's a couple interesting things here in terms of the SCC tool actually running. There is on line number eight here, this estimated cost to develop $89,000. To be honest with you, I'm not exactly sure how Ben came up with this uh, metric, this rubric in terms of the corresponding amount of dollars and the amount of effort and the number of amount of time that is required to create this code. But truth be told, it's from a time perspective, it's actually not too far off in terms of what we actually experienced in terms of a, a number of people, right? Ben, Eric, and others, and us uh, uh, writing these 3,000 plus lines of YAML code. So somehow it's pretty, pretty accurate. And you can see that hey, it gives us a pretty quick view in this, uh, with this tool. What does this also look like from an Azure perspective? Now you can see what we've started to do is we've started to replicate all of the infrastructure that we have in AWS in Azure as well for the Dunder Mifflin infrastructure. But you can see there's over 3,000 lines of code in AWS, but there's only about Hey, 1,100 lines of code here, about 1,000 lines of code in Terraform. And well, why is that? It's just, wait, at the point at which, at the point in time that I ran this analysis, we haven't yet moved all of our code, replicated all of our different services, our infrastructure in Azure as well. Now, it'll be interesting to see when that is fully done, are we going to get the equivalent 3,000 lines of code? Is it going to be a little more? Is it going to be a little bit less? And you can see in the current state of things, well, it says uh, the tool SEC is estimating that uh, there's about it costs about thirty one thousand dollars, maybe about three and a half months. 
which makes sense, right? It should be a little bit less time than the amount of code that we saw on the AWS side. Now, I mentioned at the top that we're gonna have four basic demos. So this brings us to our very first basic demo. And the reason these are basic is we're just building up on this and it's intended to give you a little bit of a flavor as to kind of the thought process in terms of thinking about our code and the corresponding analysis that we wanna do. So I'm gonna switch over to my terminal here. So again, I just switched over to my terminal. You guys should be seeing my, uh, my shell here on my machine. And I'll just mention a couple things here. At the top, you can see that uh, I, I have two tabs. So the left tab here, I'm currently in my templates directory. This just happens to be where I've placed my cloud formation code for analysis. On the right hand side here, and I'll go to this second tab here, you can see that I'm currently in my DM infrastructure AZ directory. This happens to be where I have the code for Azure, all of the Terraform code for Azure. So if I go back to the first tab here, and all I need to do is in the directory where my code is run SCC. Now check that out. SCC just ran, looked at all of my 3000 lines of code and came up with this quick analysis. Pretty awesome. It ran immediately. In years past, many years ago, right? I would do similar things. Our team would have similar things. And hey, our tools didn't run this fast. Similarly, if I go to the second tab here, where I've got my Azure code and run SCC again, well, hey, you can see what we saw on the slide is uh, what we see now in the output itself. Now, as I mentioned before, I've done a number of code reviews over the years. And one of the first things that you wanna do well is, yeah, of course, get the code, right? Clone the repository, but you also wanna get a sense of what is the code, what languages are there, how many files are there, how many lines of code. So whether you are a independent or third-party consultant, whether you are an internal, security analyst or engineer, internal uh, code reviewer, first thing that you're gonna to wanna to do is get a sense of, well, what is it that you have to review? The SCC tool gives you a great inventory, a great view of what that looks like to help you scope out your engagement. So going back to the slides here, that was a little bit of background, a little bit of overview, the first basic demo that we have in place. Now, on the next slide here, slide number 10, this brings us to, well, our different cloud static analysis tools that we are going to look at in, the, in this session here. Now, I will say that there are a lot of different static analysis tools available on the marketplace. And we specifically looked at ones that are free, that are open source, got a publicly available repository, GitHub repository associated with them. So we didn't talk about, we didn't look at any commercial ones for the purposes of this discussion. These three are some of the most common, widely used, popular, and useful tools for various reasons. There are a number of other tools in the static analysis space. Some of you may be using those. If so, feel free to go ahead and chime in here in the chat, share that with your fellow attendees, just so we can get a sense of what tools you guys are using. But yeah, these tend to be three of the most popular ones. On the next slide here, slide number 11. Well, which versions specifically did we use, for, did I use for this webcast, this uh, analysis? You can see the versions, which are very recent versions published by um, all three of these different providers. And the second row here on this table, this support row, this is very important. One of the obvious things, key things that we want to do when we are looking at and analyzing static analysis tools is to see what languages, what platforms does the tool itself support? I already mentioned that our Dunder Mifflin application is deployed to both AWS and to Azure. Well, uh, CFN NAG, which is a tool by Stelligent, well, they are specifically designed just for analyzing cloud formation code. Well, you can see that CFN NAG in the first column here only has support for cloud formation. If all of your infrastructure is deployed to AWS and if it happens to be written in cloud, uh, cloud formation, that is a great option for you. But what if you've got, you live in a multi-cloud world like many organizations are today? Well, this is where some other tools like Chekhov or Terrascan come into play. Chekhov in the second column here, you can see it support, has support not only for, Terra, uh, for cloud formation, but also for Terraform, 
also Azure Resource Manager, also Kubernetes, and there are additional languages and platforms that it supports as well. On the far right-hand side, you can see we've got TerraScan. Kind of as the name implies, TerraScan was originally created to scan Terraform, which of course, as you see here, it's got support for. It's also got support for Kubernetes, for Helm, and for Customize right, in, the, uh, in the cloud native space as well. So leading edge in terms of those different types of solutions. All right, now the last row here, we've got different output formats. And this is also extremely important. At the very end of this session, we'll see an example of where this is going to come into play. And these output formats really help you ingest automatically in an automated way, all of your different findings into your other tools of choice in your DevOps tool chain. And we'll see an example of how you can go about integrating this into your, uh, uh, into your Jenkins pipeline that we're gonna be using as an example. Now, before I move on to the next slide, I see that Joseph has a question here. Are there any particular commercial tools that you recommend for not only IAC, infrastructure as code scanning, but also app code scanning as well? All right, so from an app code perspective, so so far what we're, what we're mainly talking about here in this session, as Joseph rightly points out, is the infrastructure code, cloud formation, Azure Resource Manager, Terraform, and so on. But what about the Dunder Mifflin application running up in the cloud? What about static analysis for those applications? Now, there's a number of good commercial tools that I've used over the years. You've got uh, Fortify, that was uh, HP, now MicroFocus Fortify. You've got IBM AppScan from a scanning perspective. You've got Coverity from, and they've got a lot of good uh, native uh, C, C++ language support. So there's a lot of great commercial tools that do that as well. Also, from an application scanning perspective, you also have a lot of great open source solutions. The catch about the open source solutions though is that, hey, they tend to be, uh, most of them, many of them tend to be specific per language. For example, on the Java side, you've got uh, find bugs, find security bugs, which is a really good one. You've got uh, PumaScan written by one of my friend and co-author Eric Johnson on the, uh, on the .NET side. Um, so depending on the language, there's a lot of different options available for you. One of the more recent leading options here is a tool called SEMGREP, right? So highly recommend checking out SEMGREP from an application scanning perspective as well. All right. Yeah, so Parth mentions, hey, are these tools open source or paid? So I just verbally mentioned some commercial tools on the static analysis side, just for your reference. But all the tools that we see here on this slide, just to, to, just to reiterate, are all free and open source. You can download them right now by going to their websites and use them right away. And we'll see some examples of using these here momentarily. All right, so the per for the purposes of our analysis today, remember, what's the scope of our analysis? Well, it is the Dunder Mifflin infrastructure code. And we deploy that Dunder Mifflin infrastructure to AWS and Azure. In AWS, remember, I mentioned we are using CloudFormation. And on the Azure side, we are using Terraform. So as a result, well, these tools, as we just saw on the prior slide, only have support for certain platforms. CFN NAG only has support for CloudFormation. Chekhov has support for both CloudFormation and Terraform, which is why we see it in both sides of this slide here. And TerraScan, while it does support all three cloud, major cloud providers, AWS, Azure, GCP, well, it supports it via Terraform. So if you happen to have written your infrastructure code in cloud formation, like we have for Dunder Mifflin, well, TerraScan won't scan that corresponding AWS code. So this is the scope of our analysis here for today. And, and granted, I will say up front here and readily admit that, hey, this is a limited scope, but hey, we've got to have some code to scan. Well, we decide to scan our Dunder Mifflin infrastructure. And another tip here in terms of not only language and platform support, but another tip in terms of using not only commercial, but free tools is to always run these tools against your actual code. I've had situations in the past where two different tools, commercial tools, seemingly support, right? The same language, the same platform, run one, against my code base, run the other one, and there are noticeably different results. So you always wanna run these tools against your actual code that you're using in your organization. So this brings us to our second basic demo here in terms of running some scans. 
So I'm going to go ahead and go back to my terminal here. And again, I'm in the first tab in my terminal. And this is where I've got my AWS cloud formation code. And so let's go ahead and just run the CFN NAG scan against my code in this directory. So I'm going to say dash I for the input directory. And the input directory is dot my current directory. And I want to say that the dash O, the output format here, is JSON. Now, before I hit Enter on this, if you've ever run any of these static analysis tools, you will know that there's going to be a lot of input output that flies by here, right? So hey, don't get uh, overwhelmed with all of this output here. We'll talk about some important pieces of this. Once I hit Enter, you can see, bam, it runs it right away. Now, I'm not going to scroll all the way up here and show you everything. But like every good static analysis tool, hey, it tells you where there is a finding. There is a finding in this, in this example, the vpc.yaml file. And it's got an ID number associated with the CFN NAG tool itself, a corresponding description. And oh, importantly, by the way, it mentions the line numbers. Now, this is the start of the line number, the start of the uh, cloud formation, the AWS resource defined in there. So it's giving you the block of code that you want to start looking at. And this W60 is associated with two different blocks of code, starting at these line numbers. CFN NAG specifically, in terms of severity, has both a warn and uh, a failure, right? You can see an example of the fail right here, right? So that's CFN NAG. Now, you can, I'm going to go ahead and run uh, Chekhov really quickly. And again, the syntax is a little different, the dash D. You know what? Let me go ahead and clear my screen first, right? So it's up at the top. I'm going to go ahead and run Chekhov dash D directory. What's the directory? Dot the current directory. Again, the dash O, the output format is JSON in our example here. So if I go ahead and hit enter, you can see a bunch of input is going to fly by in just a moment. And you can see that, hey, these scans run relatively quickly. This is 3,000 lines of code that both CFN NAG and Chekhov just analyzed for us. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if you use static analysis tools for any period of time, there have been many tools in the past where I would hit essentially scan like this, run the command to scan, and it would take minutes. Sometimes it would take hours. In some cases, it even took days, right? So modern static analysis tools right, are, uh, are run very quickly, which is really important for us in terms of in integrating them, injecting them into our CI CD pipeline from a DevOps workflow perspective. Now here, in addition, just like we saw with CFN NAG, you can see that, hey, this uh, 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 checkoff also gives us, of course, the line numbers associated with these particular issues. And if I scroll up just a little bit, it gives us actually snippets of the code, highlighting what that is. So that's, that's useful. And if I were to scroll up some more, one notable difference, though, is that unlike CFN NAG that says warn or fail, well, Chekhov actually doesn't have a severity associated with them. Um, also, but what is useful, though, is you can see that Chekhov provides a nice little summary. How many tests were run? How many failed? Right? What's the version that we're actually using? So that's a nice little summary. right? CFN NAG actually doesn't provide its summary by default in the output there. One other, whoops, one other thing to run here. I'll show you another example. If I run Chekhov one more time, and I'm going to go ahead and change the output format and change the output format to the supported uh, GitHub failed only, right? And if I run that, you can see that in a moment, it's going to give us some output. It's a totally different format. Now, you don't have to read all of this here, but one thing to note is that there, in this case, again, there's no severity because Chekhov doesn't give us the severity that they suggest, but there's also, in, interestingly, no line numbers in this particular case, right? So just something to watch out for with the different output formats. Now, finally, I'm going to just show you the, again, the basic example here of running the Terraform, uh, TerraScan scan. So I'm going to go ahead and go over to my second tab, which is, point, which is already in my uh, directory that has my Azure Terraform templates. So if I go ahead and run TerraScan scan, and the dash O, the output format is, I'm going to just say JUnit XML in this particular case. Go ahead and hit Enter. And you can see that, hey, it gives us a bunch of information again. Now, just like before, it gives us a little bit of a description. What is the issue? What line number is this particular issue on? 
but it also gives us, check this out, the severity. Now, TerraScan has a severity that is uh, low. And if I scroll up just a little bit here, right, just to show you some other examples, you can see there's an example of a medium severity right here. And there is an example of a high severity. And, you know, having done a lot of code reviews, you know, hey, when I first start the code review, my, uh, my, I'm so excited. I say, hey, I'm going to find all these amazing issues in it. And shortly after starting the uh, starting the engagement, I, I say, oh, you know, hey, why did I why did I do this? You have to see so much code, right? Your eyes basically start to, to bleed, if you will. But uh, here, if I go ahead and run the TerraScan scan, uh, uh, in terms of uh, oh, in terms of in terms of the TerraScan scan, right? The uh, you've got the the that that severity, the low, medium, and high, in addition to the to the line numbers and the description. So with that. I'm going to go ahead and go back now to right, the slides. And here on the slides, this is what we just did in terms of the basics of running these tools against our infrastructure code. So what is the summary right, in terms of what is the difference between these different solutions? And at a high level, we wanted to take a look at, OK, well, what were the total number of findings? And on the left-hand side in the lower left corner, you can see that, hey, between Chekhov and CFN NAG, which we used to scan our AWS code, well, you can see that CFN NAG actually found 92 issues, and Chekhov found 35. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean just because one tool found a greater number of raw issues, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's better, right? This is where you want to do your analysis and comparison. But then here, at the top, OK, if it's not just about the raw findings, total number of findings, which is important, it's useful, right? How, how broad is the scanning? Can it find stuff? But you also, you know, I, I find it useful to look at the unique findings here. So it turns out there are 31 unique CFN NAG findings and 25 unique uh, Chekhov findings. Similarly, on the Azure side, hey, there were 37 total findings on the, uh, for, uh, for Terraform. And there were 17 unique findings that, for, that TerraScan discovered. And in terms of uniques, there was 29 versus 8 here, right? So it's a, it's a bit of a difference. Well, it's not just about those. Let's go ahead and take a look at the counts. It's not just about the counts. Let's go ahead and take a look at these one at a time here. And we're going to go ahead and start with Azure on the next slide in terms of what were the different types of findings that were discovered. Now, I'm going to warn you, when I go to the next slide, it's going to have a lot of text on it, right? You don't have to read the whole thing. It's more about thinking about, wait, what was the categories of different findings that were actually discovered? So here on the, the upcoming slide, right, what I did and on the next slide after this, I should have said that we're going to see a little bit of an eye chart. There's going to be a lot of text on the upcoming slide. But in addition to the raw findings themselves, and what I went ahead and did was I categorized the different findings into different categories, as you see down here at the bottom, which findings were more application related, which were compute, data protection, IAM, logging, network, and storage. And you saw from when we ran the tools in the output, there were actually no categories. These are just categories that I created to try to help guide how we were thinking about the output from the different tools. And you can see in some cases, one tool found more, one tool found less, one tool found none, right, in terms of the different categories of these findings. So by doing this type of uh, view, you get a little bit of a sense of, OK, well, where is that particular tool? Where might need, it need an enhancement to its rule set? Here on the next slide is a comparison. Now, there for each AWS for Azure here first, and then AWS, we've got two sets of slides that summarize the findings um, in terms of the different categories that I just mentioned. And you can see at the top in terms of application, both of these tools say, you know what, you should really enable a WAF. So we happen to clump that in the application category. Some of these, you, if you look closely, you might say, you know, Frank, hey, I think that that should technically be in a different category. Totally valid comment, right? If you have any suggestions like that, we always want to make this better. So feel free to go ahead and you know, chime in with your suggestions here. Now, um, here, in terms of uh, the, the findings, right? you can see in the compute row, there's actually some differences. TerraScan actually points out that, hey, uh, they, they suggest that you have resource locks enabled. Now, resource locks is an Azure feature that allows you to prevent any modifications to a particular cloud resource that you may have created or deployed. But if you look at the Chekhov findings, you can see that the Chekhov compute findings don't mention resource locks. 
but they point out some other things like certain AKS related Azure Kubernetes service configurations, Microsoft anti-malware being configured appropriately and so on. So this is one reason why you might also want to run multiple tools because different tools will give you different sets of findings. Some items here in data protection as well. You can see that Chekhov found a, a number of things in terms of configuring different services appropriately. And one finding down at the bottom from an RBAC, role-based access control perspective. All right, in the last slide here that I'll mention comparing TerraScan and Chekhov here in terms of logging, network, and storage. Different best practices, some of these are similar. Ensure that logging is enabled for Key Vault, right? Ensure AKS has logging on the right-hand side. Storage is appropriately uh, uh, logged as well. So a number of similarities, but also some differences between the specific findings of these tools. And I see that Alex has a question here in terms of, hey, explaining just one more time, how is CFN NAG different from Chekhov or TerraScan? Well, you know, there's a summary slide that compares the different supported languages, the supported platforms a few slides ago. I'm not gonna go back to that, right? But these slides will be available for you afterwards as well. Different tools have different support for different platforms. For example, CFN NAG is an AWS only tool and specifically only scans cloud formation code. TerraScan um, is a, a tool that scans other languages, but specifically Terra, uh, Terraform, Kubernetes, Helm, and so on, right, in terms of some of those supported platforms. Chekhov scans actually uh, CloudFormation, Azure uh, Resource Manager, and Terraform in addition to others as well. So that language support is one uh, key factor there, Alex. And uh, you also mentioned, hey, we thought we were focusing only on two during the presentation. Yeah, we were actually talking about three, right? CFN NAG, Chekhov, and TerraScan here, right? So those are the three that we're, we're comparing. So let's go ahead and move on here and talk about AWS. Just like we did before, right? We've got the different categories down here at the bottom. And there, on the far right-hand side, there is an additional category that we hadn't seen before. Now, this was an informational category. When I was reviewing the findings, I found that both tools, both CFN NAG and Chekhov in this case that we used to scan our cloud formation code, they had some findings that I would call more best practices, more informational. So I lumped them in those categories. And just by at a glance, you can see here, but what are the trade-offs? As I just mentioned, right? As Alex was asking, I just mentioned that CFN NAG only has support for cloud formation. But hey, it seems to have more uh, broader coverage in terms of its findings, in terms of the types of things that it actually discovers, just by looking at the height of these orange bars in comparison to the height of the blue bars. But it's not just about the raw counts as well. Here on the next slide, right, for your reference, when you get these slides afterwards, is the comparison of um, what did CFN NAG find versus Chekhov in these different categories. Now, this is interesting, just like we saw with Azure, you can see that Chekhov says, hey, you should really have the WAF enabled for your application. CFN NAG, interestingly, doesn't find that. Now, check this out. In the compute row, ECR, the Elastic Container Registry, this is where you store your Docker images, your container images, and so on. A more relatively newer recent uh, feature is to have this scan on push enabled. That basically says when a new image is saved up to the registry, automatically scan that image. Very useful feature, right? You want to have that enabled by default, CFN NAG says, which I, I agree with. Chekhov doesn't point that out, but they do say, hey, you should enable container insights on your cluster. This is to get some usage and, and uh, uh, utilization information about the containers in your cluster. Again, an example of two different tools highlighting and finding two different things. In the data protection row, you can see that both tools mention enabling HTTPS. Both tools mention in terms of storing data securely, appropriately, in terms of specifying a secret key, things like that. IAM. Now, in essence, at a high level, both tools are mentioning similar, the same things from an IAM perspective, not allowing too much access. In my opinion, the way that CFN NAG describes it is pretty clear, right? Don't allow star on these specific things. Whereas Chekhov is basically the saying the same thing, but their wording is, hey, you don't want to do that because you want to prevent data exfiltration. You want to prevent privilege escalation. You want to prevent arbitrary writing, which you know, both of them are useful. I can see that. 
logging, right? There's some similar logging items that are mentioned in terms of enabling CloudTrail, CloudWatch, and so on. On the next slide, the last slide in terms of the comparison, you got the network storage uh, items here. And you can see that on the network side, CFNNAC has a lot of different findings that it's discovered in terms of egress traffic being allowed, hey, um, um, uh, allowed outbound en masse, not necessarily a good thing, but also some inbound traffic coming in. Now you can see, of course, Chekhov finds that item about inbound traffic specific to port 22 as well. And we're going to take a look at that in a uh, another demo that we've got coming up here in a little bit. Storage, some similar findings. And down here at the bottom, those informational ones, the best practice ones that I mentioned. CFNNAG says, hey, you should have a usage plan. Well, that's, that's useful. They also mention, hey, you shouldn't have a resource in your code with an explicit name, because if you need to automatically update it, you would update the stack. Hey, this will potentially disallow updates, which will make it harder to manage your infrastructure. That's useful, right? But I put that under informational best practice. They also mention, hey, security groups should have a description. Again, useful thing, which Chekhov mentions as well. But again, something that I, meant, I list more personally as a best practice or an informational item. So with that, let's go ahead and do a, another basic demo here of fixing an issue. Now, I'm going to go ahead and switch over now to uh, my editor, my code editor. And I'm actually using my, uh, I'm using VS Code, Visual Studio Code here for this. Now, if you remember back to when we ran some scans, when we ran those scans, we always saw the line number associated with that particular finding. Well, it turns out that one of the issues is that both uh, CFNNAG and Chekhov discover is that potential open uh, inbound access. And in this particular case, that inbound access is defined here on line 50 and 54 as 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0, meaning any IP can come in and connect to port 80 and 443. Now, this is, I would say, if uh, CFNNAG found this, this was a false positive because in this particular case, we want to serve our Dunder Mifflin application to the world via the browser, and it needs to be available on port 80 and 443, right? But, so these are valid, right? This is a, a valid configuration. But another item that we just saw mentioned on the slide here, scrolling down a little bit, I'm going to go to line number, ha, here it is, 172. Now you can see we've got that same ingress access allowed from anywhere, but specifically for port 22. And this is an item that both CFNNAG and Chekhov had highlighted. Now, here you can see that uh, it is associated with on line 166, our management security bastion group. This is the security group, the stateful firewall for our bastion host. Do we in general want to allow SSH access to our bastion host from anywhere in the world? No, that's not really a, a good best practice, right? So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my terminal here again. And in my um, AWS tab, which is the first tab, I'm going to go ahead and clear the screen. And I'm going to go ahead and run the CFN NAG scan again. And I'm going to run it, but just with certain subset, looking at a certain subset of the code, dash I, specifically the stuff in the VPC directory, which is the directory that contains that security group's file that we were just looking at. And I'm going to do this here to just highlight to you that, hey, if I scroll up a little bit, we had line number uh, 172, right? And uh, here, and that was part of this code that starts at block 167. And you can see we've got security group found with CIDR were open to the world on ingress. Not a good practice. So check that out, right? We've got line 167. Once I fix the code, do a basic simple fix, you'll see that we'll come back here and rerun the scan and the issue will, of course, disappear. Now, if I scroll back to the bottom, I just want to show, go ahead and show that Chekhov, of course, finds this as well. I'm going to do the dash D for the directory, VPC, where my file is that I want to scan, JSON format. And if I run that, you can see down here at the bottom, it discovered five issues, all right? So keep that in mind. There are five issues that were discovered. So I'm going to go back here to the code in Visual Studio Code. And I'm just going to go ahead and fix this code. By not having it allowed by, to anywhere from anywhere in the world, I'm going to go ahead and say, hey, I only want to allow people 
that are coming from my, the known admin IP to be able to access port 22 on my bastions, all right? So I just made that simple code change. I go back to the terminal. I'm gonna keep in mind, look, check out that number five there. And if I run the scan again, boom, in just a moment, you will see that it went from five down to four, right? Hey, so this is the, the basics here of running these scans and the issues actually going away. So going back to the slides here, well, hey, it's not just about manually fixing these issues. As I mentioned, with these basic demos, we're kind of showing the process, we're showing the comparison, the usage of these various tools. And we mentioned this already in terms of the different output formats. You've seen some JSON output format, you've seen some XML. Another key thing here is that you want to check out which output formats your tools support. Most commonly used output formats are listed here on the slide in terms of XUnit, JUnit format, which is just an XML schema. And this is very useful because, well, it turns out that our CI CD tools, our uh, continuous deployment tools, all can ingest different formats like these, like check style format, another XML schema for sharing static analysis results. We've already seen the JSON format in running some of the scans. Now watch out, pretty much every tool that you'll see out there supports JSON format. Um, but if your tool only supports JSON, like CFN Mag does, there's some extra manual work that you need to get done in terms of doing a conversion from JSON to a format like check style that your CI CD tool understands. Separate note here, there's a relatively newer format called Serif. Serif. This is also a JSON based schema from originally from uh, Microsoft and it is starting to get more and more traction, right? But it's been, uh, it's been a little bit slow, but you will see some tools supporting that as well. So if you've got these different output formats, how do you go ahead and automatically parse them? You don't wanna do like I just did, manually review all of those different findings. You want your tooling, your uh, CI CD pipeline to automatically right, uh, process some of these findings for you as well. Couple examples here, if you can go ahead on the left-hand side, uh, parse the X unit results. And by looking at that, you parsing the X unit results, we're using the Google test utility tool, their assert framework to go ahead and parse the output in JUnit XML format here. Now we've also got this failure threshold on line number nine. Keep this in mind. We are going to uh, look at this here in a little bit more detail in an upcoming basic demo. And this is just another example of parsing check style results on the right hand side. Example here in terms of line number four using the check style tool utility to parse the output from the tool in this XML format. All right, so how do you go about automating static analysis? This is a snippet of code from the a Jenkins file that you will see here momentarily on line number five. You can see that, hey, we've, uh, we've manually run the CFN NAG tool up to this point a number of times. Now though, hey, as a best practice, we don't wanna run this tool ourselves. We want our automation, our automated tooling to run this for us as well. And this is how you do it, integrating it into your automated pipeline so that every time a build runs, the CFN NAG scan is also going to run. Now I see that Tanisha has a good question here on, hey, well, what about blue teams? How can blue teams benefit from this process? Now, um, from a blue team perspective, right, the blue team's job is to better defend the organization. And so part of understanding how to better defend the organization in these modern environments, modern tools that are being used in terms of the cloud, infrastructure as code, DevOps, CI, CD. Well, on the blue team side, we need to understand what tools are being used, what that process is, what that workflow actually looks like. And it used to be in the old days that, hey, maybe some blue team members were the ones doing the assessment, were the ones doing the scanning. We would have to run a lot of that stuff manually. Now we can get catch the low hanging fruit by integrating, Tanisha, to your question, the scans into um, some automation like we see here. So let's take a closer look at this. This is our last basic demo for today. And I'm gonna switch back over to, uh, I'm gonna switch to something else. I'm gonna switch over to a VM that I've got running. And this VM here that I just switched over to actually has uh, Jenkins, a whole pipeline running. And here in Jenkins, if you haven't used Jenkins before, 
that's okay. There's many other tools that are similar to Jenkins that your organization might be using, Azure DevOps, uh, GitHub Actions, uh, GitLab, and so on, uh, Bamboo, whatever the tool might be in your organization. In fact, different departments might be using different tools in your organization as well. At the very beginning, side note, folks, at the very beginning of the session today, Laura mentioned that this is the third part in a three-part webcast series associated with cloud and DevSecOps best practices. In part number one, Eric Johnson talked more about, well, different Git solutions, different DevOps solutions, Git ops, Git workflows in terms of some of these best practices as well. We've got an archive of that webcast if you guys are interested in checking it out. Here on this page, this Jenkins homepage in the newer Blue Ocean interface, I just want to highlight that we've got a number of different pipelines that are doing different things. We've got pipelines for building our API code. We've got pipelines for automatically building our web code. And at the top here, we've got a pipeline for automatically building and deploying to AWS, our infrastructure code. So if I go ahead and click on that pipeline, you can see that a number of runs have happened in the, uh, in the past. And there are different colors, different color codings. We've got one that's green here. So I'm going to go ahead and click the green one that I ran some time ago. Now here in this one that successfully completed, you can see that we've got different phases of our pipeline. We've got some initialization, some setup stuff on the left, but we've got our main build portion of the pipeline. We've got our test portion of the pipeline, which is the part that is most applicable to us in terms of our conversation today. Then we've got the deploy phase of the pipeline to deploy the infrastructure up to the cloud. And then we've got our post deploy in terms of some cleanup steps. Now check this out. Here at the top where it says tests, you'll notice that there are no tests, right? Because if I go ahead and click the test phase, you can see at the bottom that we haven't yet integrated the testing, the automated testing into this pipeline when, when we first deployed it. So if I go ahead and exit out of this view to go back to the main outline, to the main view of all of the runs, you can see that, hey, if I go ahead and click this one here, this yellow one. Now this yellow means that, hey, this build is unstable. There are some issues that the dev team, the DevOps team, the infrastructure team probably wants to check out. And that's because here in the test phase, we have integrated our testing down here at the bottom, and it has resulted in our case, 43 errors. Now, the reason that there's only 43 and not 92, like we saw in the slides when we first, uh, when we were looking at the scan running, is we've done different things. I've done different things in this VM, in this environment to fix certain issues, suppress different issues, and so on. All right. Now, if I close out of this one, you can see that in this example, in this red one, we also have 43 errors but it's red and it failed. It skipped the deploy phase after the tests failed. Well, why is that? Okay, let's talk about that here. I'm gonna switch over to my code editor here in the VM itself and show you the Jenkins file. Now the Jenkins file is what allows you to define the different phases that we just visually saw, build, test, deploy, post-deploy, and so on. So here, starting on line 174 is the test phase where we have on line 178, integrated the CFN NAG scan, saying that it should scan the templates directory with the output format of JSON. Now there is a catch though. Jenkins doesn't understand the JSON format. So the extra work that I mentioned in passing when we were talking about the slides is that now you have to create a script to go ahead and convert the format, convert uh, the JSON format into a format that J uh, J Jenkins understands, specifically in this case, the J unit format here that we see on line 182. Now, the reason that, hey, that build was yellow is because we've said, hey, mark the build as unstable if there are more than five errors, but only fail the build here on line 183 if there are more than 100 issues. So I'm going to go ahead and change this and say change that to 50. And then I'm going to go ahead and, re and deploy this change which is gonna automatically kick off the pipeline, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and um, do a git commit saying that I updated the threshold. I do a git push and now, right? It's gonna take just a moment. I've updated that code, that code changed. I pushed that code to my repository. And if I go back to the main Jenkins view, 
in a moment, right, you will see, if I refresh the page, you will see that another run of this pipeline, run number 17, has kicked off here. Now, I won't, you know, make you wait the minute that it takes for this to run, but when this runs, it's going to be red, even though there are only 43 issues, because I have just updated the corresponding threshold, all right? So if I go back to the slides and uh, uh, here, right, that was our last basic demo here in terms of automation. And we want to understand what our teams are using and integrate security checks throughout that entire pipeline. So before I kind of summarize what we talked about here, I see that uh, Vasilios has a good question. Hey, so static analysis of cloud code substitutes for a CSPM. So CSPM, of course, is a cloud security posture management solution. Now, this is the fancy Gartner acronym for, hey, what do you do to scan your uh, running cloud infrastructure? So you've got a bunch of stuff, infrastructure services deployed to the cloud, and then you want to scan and see what's actually going on. And uh, so that's the active scanning, I guess I would call it. The reason that what we've talked about today is your static analysis is because it's only scanning your static application code, your non-running application code. So exactly, Vasilius, to your point, you can definitely have both of them. That's, that's also a, a best practice in terms of, hey, not only doing scanning the code, but also scanning the running environment, the running services. And now kind of the next generation, I would say, of CSPM solutions is kind of marrying both of those, is combining what you're doing from a code scanning perspective, IAC perspective, marrying it with what is in the cloud, and then seeing if there's actually a delta. Is there some configuration drift? Did somebody log into the cloud and make a change that is then different from what your infrastructure code has? And you want to have the source of truth. What is your source of truth? Usually, that's going to be your infrastructure code. And it'll detect these next generation of commercial tools will detect this over time, detect this drift, and help us, from a security perspective, get a better handle on it. Right? So excellent question. If anybody has any additional questions, feel free to, to chime in here. But just to summarize here, what did we talk about? Hey, next week or tomorrow, today, this week, next week, you know, try to go ahead and get a little bit more visibility into what is your scanning coverage. Exactly what Vasilios just said is, do we have good coverage from an infrastructure scanning perspective? Do we have good coverage from an active scanning, our cloud security posture management perspective? Next month or within the next month, go ahead and identify what are some additional scanning tools to use, like we talked about today. Get access to your code, go ahead and download it, and quickly run some of these scans against your tool. You saw how quickly it was to run. Based on the, the support for the different tools and the quality of findings, make some decisions about what tools you actually want to use. And in the next six months, we say this takes a little bit longer, right? Oh, within the six months, go ahead and work with your DevOps teams, understand what pipelines they have. And as we just showed, automate security into the pipeline itself. And real quick here, just I'm going to go back to the VM. And you can see that, hey, it is marked this well, hey, it's marked it as unstable here. So uh, you can see that, hey, by changing the thresholds, we can go ahead and make some differences in terms of what that output looks like in terms of continuing with the build or failing the build in some cases. Now, quick side note here, a couple other things to close on as you guys are perhaps thinking about any additional questions you might have. As we said, this is the third part in a three-part webcast series about cloud security and DevSecOps. Eric did part number one in terms of locking down Gitflow. Ben did part number two in terms of securely deploying and securing various gold images that you use to deploy, like your application functionality. And today's was all about static analysis for your infrastructure code. If you guys haven't heard about this, just next week, we have a totally free event for you. Two whole days of cloud security related talks from various industry experts. If you haven't already, highly encourage you to please go ahead and sign up at this uh, shortcut URL below. We've got our first annual CloudSec Next Summit. Two full days of talks at different time zones around the world. We've got a keynote from the CISO at, uh, at HashiCorp, actually the makers of Terraform. We've got another key keynote from the folks at, uh, at uh, MITRE and Microsoft in terms of, hey, what are some cloud security related items related to the SolarWinds breach? and a number of other awesome talks on various topics as well. Cloud, AWS, Azure, GCP, Kubernetes, containers, 
cloud native, and so on. So we got a packed two days for you guys to check out. Now, just uh, in summary, right? That was uh, that was our webcast. I want to thank you guys all for attending. If you want to connect with me, feel free, please feel free to do so on Twitter or LinkedIn. And if you're interested in this type of material, right, you might want to check out our SEC 540 class. We've got a number of runs coming up here um, in, uh, in uh, the live online format with some in-person runs coming later in the year as well. I'm teaching the one in June here um, as well. If you guys, uh, maybe I will see some of you guys in that, in that class. Now, before I turn it over to Laura to close it out, I see that uh, Syed has a question here. Hey, should drift detection be run as a job in the deployment pipeline or on schedules via a cron job? Yeah, and generally that's something that's going to be run on a, you know, not, well, it's not via cron, but conceptually, right? Cron runs on a regular basis. That's something that you would run on a regular basis. It would run automated on a regular basis as well. Yeah, that part, uh, and there are different tools that you might think to, to utilize in your pipeline. But you know, yeah, it would be potentially uh, both of those approaches. But you know, generally, it would just also run on a continuous basis. Yeah, good question. All right, Alex, thanks for the feedback. Appreciate it. Um, I don't see any other questions. So hey, Laura, I'm going to turn it over to you to, uh, to close it out. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Frank. You did a fabulous job, as always. Uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that the slides and the recording for the webcast will be available in the portal uh, through your portal account shortly, uh, usually within a day or so. And you'll be able to find your CEUs for all your completed webcasts by logging into your SANS portal account. You can navigate to your account dashboard and click My Webcast. And then you can download your CEUs on the right hand side of the page. Hey, Laura, yes, go thanks. Ahead, Frank. thanks so much. I see. Hey, you know, we kind of doing things in a little bit of a out of order here, but I see Syed has a, another question here. Hey, at what point or maturity level should you stop failing the builds as a result of failed static analysis jobs? Excellent question, right? And, you know, this, you know, DevOps is all about not just the automation, not just about the tooling, but it's about the culture and collaboration. And, you know, if you are just starting out to incorporate static analysis into your pipelines, working with dev teams, DevOps teams for the first time, suggestion. Do not fail the build for some period of time. Work with them to integrate that automated scan like we saw into the pipeline, mark it as unstable, but do not fail it to start, right? And then as you build up that relationship, because you know when you scan something for the first time, there might be 10, 20, 50, 92 findings. And so you don't want to fail everything right off the bat. Certainly if there's something critical, you want to talk to the team about it, but you want to establish that threshold. Should the threshold be 10, 20, 50? It depends on your current state. So as you build that relationship and start to fix some of these items, you might lower the threshold from 50 to 40 to 30 to 10 to 5 and so on. But then you also want to make sure that, hey, once you get to a certain level of security maturity, exactly as you said, then you could mark it as failed at a lower level. Because then the, the DevOps teams have are working with you on the security side to um, so that they're not caught by surprise, essentially. So yeah, excellent question. All right. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, look I would to just, if Frank, if I could, I just want to give a plug for our next cloud security webcast. Somebody during the presentation had asked about an API webcast, and we actually have one tomorrow. The threat detection with cloud API logs, a case study from Capital One with Sean McCullough and Ryan Nicholson is tomorrow, Thursday, May 27th at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And you can register for that at sans.org slash webcast. So thank awesome. you all very much. And Frank, if you have any other closing words. No, awesome. Hey, thank you so much, Laura. And uh, look forward to seeing you guys uh, online or in person in the future. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.